Good evening friends, we will be dealing with uh, NEET SS 2021 Cardiology Recall. Now uh, it's been a long time coming, so for the first time we had uh, NEET 2021 occurring in 2022. So we will go straight for the uh, recall session. So my analysis of this paper, it was a difficult paper, questions were of a much higher standard than what you typically expect from NB as per your previous question papers. So it should make you happy if you have actually put in the efforts. So if it's a simple paper, then things usually tend to equalize. They focus mainly on clinical scenarios and practical application. So again, remember this was a difficult paper. It was not an easy or a moderate, moderately difficult paper. So, I want you to keep your expectations realistic. So, in any exam, you are never expected to get 100% of your questions right. There will be questions at a far higher level or landmine questions. You will not be expected to answer them. Remember, leaving questions is also an art. It's not that you try to attempt all questions. You should know which questions to attempt and which questions to leave. So, you cannot hit every ball out of the park, although Sehwag may beg to differ. Leaving the ball is also equally important. So for every sehwag, you need a draw it. And it's also equally important to know which ball to leave so that you don't get bold. So please remember this. You should know which questions to attempt, which questions to leave. Remember, it is not only knowledge, but execution of the knowledge, which is equally important for the exam. So coming to topic wise distribution. So there are total 62 questions we have, which we have been able to record. So I'm grateful to all the students who contributed to these questions. We could not do a session without you guys. So the most important topic, which was frequently asked was valvular heart disease, which contributed to 13 questions, followed by congenital heart disease, which contributed to 12 questions. An interesting thing is CAD is such a big topic, such an essential topic, but there were mere five questions from CAD. Again, this is just my distribution. For example, you could, you could, a question which could be in valvular heart disease can also be included in clinical cardiology. Again, it's a matter of perspective. I just included that in valvular heart disease. So remember, valvular heart disease followed by congenital heart disease. In, you get questions from all across the spectrum of cardiology, but mainly it's valvular heart disease and congenital heart disease. So out of the 62 questions, around 40 to 42 questions were straight from the videos. Nothing to break your head from. They were directly from the videos. If you have watched the videos, you can just straight away answer them. Around six to eight questions. These are questions which we taught you, but it required a bit of logic and presence of mind to answer them. So these were indirectly from our videos. So again, for ex an example of that would be a, a young boy who is asymptomatic presenting you with cyanosis and clubbing. So they gave you a lot of options like Epstein, TGA with VSD, Trichospit ratio with VSD. They taught you the concepts. You had to use your presence of mind to answer them. Around 6 to 8 were just basic questions like Frank sinus scene in ECG manifestations of hypokalemia, questions on hypertension, which every MD student needs to know. And around 6 to 8 questions, again, these were questions on the higher side. So again, these were questions from the fringe areas of cardiology where usually people don't ask. So again, so if you had followed our videos diligently, I would say you would get around 80% of questions correct. So again, we always, there's a famous principle called the Pareto principle, where 80% of outputs come from 20% of inputs. So 80% of questions come from 20% of what you study. It is our duty to tell you what is those 20%, to focus on what areas which is important. So it's easy for me to come and teach you about 150 to 200 hours of cardiology, but I focused my attention, I've given you 72 hours of content so that you can study as much as possible what is required in the least amount of time. So with this, we'll go for question number one. A person is evaluated by a neurologist for abnormal body movements. He's suspected to be suffering from serenam scoria. There is no history of pharyngitis. What should be done? Echo, ASO, clinical diagnosis, throat swab culture. So again, they're asking you, how do you diagnose serenam scoria? And remember, serenam scoria is a clinical diagnosis. Okay, it's a clinical diagnosis. It occurs late. It's a late manifestation of rheumatic fever. Remember, by the time everything has, has uh, subsided. So there'll be no elevated ESR, no elevated CRP. There'll be no, there'll be a negative throat culture. Your ECG manifestations would have disappeared. It is a late manifestation of rheumatic fever and you diagnose it clinically. People often take an MRI brain, but that is in order to rule out other causes, not syndrome scoria. It is not whether there's any other causes of chorea. So the answer is clinical diagnosis is enough. Serenam chorea is a clinical diagnosis. All your markers would have settled by the time chorea comes in. 
and remember you take an MRI brain to rule out other diagnoses. 42 year old salesman otherwise fit presents with recurrent chest pain. So in ultrasound abdomen gallstones are seen. He is referred to a cardiologist and found to have a murmur in the left upper sternum radiating to carotids with pavus, pa, uh, pulses pavus itatus. Again they have given you a lot of echo values and they have asked you the management. Tower, saver, medical management and balloon dilation. So 42 year old. So he is a 42 year old. So he is symptomatic. He has chest pain. Okay, and he obviously has a murmur which is in the left upper part of sternum radiating carotids. So it's very clear you're dealing with aortic stenosis. There is pulses power cetatus, so it's a severe aortic stenosis. Okay, so symptomatic aortic stenosis is severe aortic stenosis. Okay, pulses power cetatus is a very sensitive marker for, for severe aortic stenosis. So again, you have a murmur, you have the patient being symptomatic and you have pulses power cetatus Everything indicates severe AS. So 42 year old male with severe AS. What do you think the etiology of the severe AS is going to be? It's likely to be a bicuspid aortic valve. Okay, so you have calcific deposits. They have not mentioned the whether it's bicuspid or tricuspid, but it's basically going to be a bicuspid aortic valve. So it's basically a 42 year old male, severe aortic stenosis, probably due to a bicuspid aortic valve. So how do you manage this case? The management of this case is obviously you have to replace the valve. Whether you do a TAVR or a SAVR, the answer is SAVR. You do a surgical aortic valve replacement. So 42 year old male, severe AS, probably due to a bicuspid aortic valve, you do a surgical aortic valve replacement. My question is why can't you do a TAVR? Now cardiology as such is going towards percutaneous replacements. So why can't you do a TAVR in this case? So you can see it here. The initially we tried TAVR for extreme high surgical risk, then high surgical risk, intermediate surgical risk, low surgical risk. Probably by the next trial we will be doing for asymptomatic patients also. So why can't you do a uh, TAVR for this case? So you can see TAVR is a management of choice for extreme surgical risk, high surgical risk, intermediate surgical risk or even low surgical risk. So in almost all subsets we prefer TAVR greater than SAVR. We do, a, we do a percutaneous replacement rather than a surgical replacement if the anatomy is favorable. But in this case, I said the answer is SAVR. Why? So this was my slide which I had discussed. I had said why TAVR is done mostly in old patients. So why TAVR is done mostly in old patients is one, TAVR trials were done on old patients. We don't have TAVR trials being done on young patients. Remember this is a 42 year old person. We don't have TAVR trials being done on young patients. And number two, remember, see, we have we have no data on TAVR valves beyond 10 to 15 years. So TAVR is a fairly new concept. It came out of, it came about in around 2004, 2005. So all your TAVR valves have data for up to 10 to 15 years. So remember, this is a 42 year old male, and he might be living up to 80 years of age. So if you put in a TAVR valve, we don't have data for TAVR valves beyond 10 to 15 years of age. But for surgical valve replacements, we have data even up to 60 years. Patients with Star Edwards valve implanted in the 1960s still are surviving and doing well. So because we don't have data for TAVR valves beyond 10 to 15 years and we have strong data for surgical, surgically replaced valve even sometimes up to 60 years and this being a young patient, we would like to do a surgical aortic valve replacement. So two reasons why we don't do a TAVR. One, the trials have all been done on old patients and two, we do not have data for TAVR valves beyond 10 to 15 years. So the answer is surgical aortic valve replacement. Now we come to the next question. Noonan syndrome is associated with supravalvular PS, supravalvular AS, ASD and PDA. The answer is ASD. So I know many of you people would have straight away written supravalvular PS, but the answer is ASD. I'll tell you why. So this is Noonan's. We all know about Noonan syndrome. So, Noonan's is a rasopathy. Okay, so it's basically something to do with a RAS gene. Mutation in PTPN11, it is autosomal dominant, it's called as male turners. So, Leopard syndrome is also called as Noonan's with lenti genes. So, Noonan's has 80% cardiac defects. And the most common cardiac defect is pulmonary stenosis with a dysplastic pulmonary. Very, very important statement. The most common cardiac defect in Noonan's is pulmonary stenosis with a dysplastic pulmonary valve. Again, we have an MCQ on dysplastic pulmonary valve. I'll describe it then. 
Another important MCQ Noonan is associated with left axis deviation. Normally when you have PS you have RVH and right axis deviation. But remember left axis deviation is intrinsically a property of Noonan syndrome. So remember your most common manifestation is pulmonary stenosis with a dysplastic pulmonary valve associated with a left axis deviation. This is followed by ASD hence this is the answer followed by HCM in 15 percent followed by VSD. Peripheral PS is seen in 3 to 12 percent. Again there is a bit of a controversy. One ASD is much more common than peripheral PS. And I would like to turn your attention to the next slide. We have discussed causes of peripheral PS. So under obstructive lesions. So again you can see all the associations. We have also discussed this particular point. This is the statement taken directly from Bonwald. So the causes of peripheral PS excludes those with associated VSD like TOF or pulmonary atresia with a VSD. And very important also excluded is Noonan syndrome. So there is no Noonan syndrome at least for Braunwald when you consider causes of peripheral PS. I don't know why when I talk, took you when I took the lectures also I told you I don't know why the reason is. So in Braunwald, Braunwald excludes Noonan syndrome as a cause of peripheral PS. So these are two reasons why. One ASD is more common and two Braunwald excludes Noonan syndrome as a cause of peripheral PS. I don't know why. Okay, so supravalar PS and peripheral PS both mean the same. The answer is AST. Transverse crease across the pinna, again it's a very basic question. We have all studied, uh, when we did our undergraduate, the stigmata of atherosclerosis. Again, we have stigma, stigma of liver disease, uh, stigma of alcoholism. Similarly, we have stigma of atherosclerosis. So one of them is a transverse crease in the pinna. It's called as Frank's sign. So you have Frank's sign, you have locomotor brachialis, xanthalasma, xanthomas, tendinous xanthomas, all those. So transverse crease in the pinna is called as Frank's sign and it's a marker of atherosclerosis. So again, this is from the BMJ. Frank's sign, a coronary artery disease predictor. So again, this is your Frank's sign. You can see the transverse ear crease. So again, increased risk of IHD and MI and it's more useful in adults less than 60 years of age. So the younger uh, the person is when he has this Frank's crease, it's much more valuable. So again, this is basically what you're studying in UG. Standard question. Tell me the uh, stigma of atherosclerosis. So now we come to the next question. True about FFR. Ratio of proximal to distal pressure. Is it true? It's false. It's ratio, it's PD by PA. So it's ratio of distal by proximal pressures. FFR of more than 0 0.90 is significant. It is false. It should be less than 0 0.8. Useful in case of more than 90% stenosis. Again, remember, FFR is used for intermediate lesions. Where we have a doubt of the severity, mostly in 50 to 70 percent severity lesions. Done at maximal hyperemia, this is a true statement. So, again, we have discussed all about FFR when we dealt with investigations in cardiology. So, I'll just come for that. So, again, when we evaluate a coronary lesion, remember there is a subjective error. So, when different people look at the angiograms, they can tend to uh, report the lesion severity differently. For example, let's take this case. So if somebody sees this, he will automatically say it's more than a 90% 90, 90 lesion. So again, we will send this straight away. So whether it's a professor or whether it's a first year PG, if you see this, there's absolutely no doubt. He will say it's a significant lesion. This lesion needs to be stented. If somebody sees this lesion, it's a reasonably normal coronary, maybe around a 20% lesion. So whether you're a professor or a first year PG, this is an insignificant lesion. You can leave this lesion alone. There is abs at both ends of the spectrum for more than 90% or say less than 40%, there is going to be no inter observer error. But if I say this, I say this lesion, this lesion here, if I ask us, if I ask a professor, he might say it's a 70% lesion. If I ask an Aston professor, he might say a 60% lesion. If I ask a first year PG, he might say it's a 50% lesion. So again, different people seeing the same angiogram can report a lesion differently. So again, you can see there is a wide inter observer error. So how do you overcome this? You do an FFR. So you put a wire across the lesion, measure the pressure here, measure the pressure here and take the ratio. This is what FFR is. It is distal coronary pressure. So pressure distal to the lesion, this is PD by pressure proximal to the lesion, which is PA. You take the ratio, if the ratio is less than 0.8, it is considered to be significant. So again, FFR is PD by PA. 
done for borderline lesions 50 to 70 percent this is the lesion where we need to assess physiological significance not 90 percent everyone will, everyone will know it's a significant lesion less than 0.8 is significant and again maximum hyperemia is paramount you can give all sorts of uh, vasodilatory agents like adenosine atp papaverin nitroprusside all those so coming to this question once more so ratio of pd by it's a proximal by distal it's distal by proximal FFR of less than 0.8 is significant and is useful for intermediate lesions of 50 to 70 percent severity. Again, this is how what FFR is done. You can see the two pressure values. The distal pressure is 68, your proximal pressure is 93, and your FFR is 68 by 93, which is 0.73. This is a significant lesion, and you need to stent this lesion. So, next question: a patient presents with inferior wall MI with mild hypotension. To diagnose additional complication, what is the next step? So, remember there is an inferior wall MI. He is having hypotension. Now, when MI can go in for hypotension due to several causes, okay, it can be due to uh, pump dysfunction. That is, there is so much amount of myocardium which is at risk. So, your pump dysfunction can be due to mechanical complications, can be due to an RVMI, can be due to a pericardial tamponade. So, a lot of complications can be there. So, again, in this case, why do you do take a V3R and a V4R to diagnose RVMI? Can RVMI have hypotension? Yes. You do an echo toward free wall rupture. Can free wall rupture have hypotension? Yes. So both can cause hypotension. So if it's an, if it's an RVMI, it can cause hypotension. If it's a free wall rupture also, you can have hypotension. But remember, if it's a free wall rupture, it's basically going to cause tamponade and you generally have severe hypotension. Remember your LV myocardium has given way, there is going to be free flow of blood into the pericardium, it goes in for ta tamperate and sometimes sudden death of the patient. Usually you have severe hypotension. Hence the answer for this is V3R and V4R. It's basically an RVMI. So again I have told you this from my slides. V4R is the single most important lead to diagnose whether it is proximal RC occlusion, distal RC occlusion or circumflex occlusion. So, we often don't take uh, laterally, we often don't take posterior leads or we don't take RV leads. We just take a 12 lead ECG and leave it around. But remember, it should be a, as a matter of good clinical practice that we take posterior leads as well as RV leads for every case of inferior volume. So, again, proximal RC occlusion in V4R, you have ST elevation and positive T wave. For the distal RC, RC occlusion, you have no ST elevation with a positive T wave. If it's circumflex occlusion, you have ST depression with a negative T wave. Again, all of this have been described. Remember, V4R greater than V3R to diagnose RVMI. So again, this is a typical case. You have inferior, you have an inferior wall MI. You can see ST elevations in 2-3 AVF. You can see a positive R wave uh, with ST elevation in uh, lead V1. And you can see V4R is having ST elevation. So this is an inferior wall MI plus an RVMI. Okay. So, where is the occlusion? It's in the proximal RC. So, you can see that ST elevation in 3 is more than 2. ST depression in AVL is more than AVR. So, all this signifies an inferior wall plus RVMI is due to a proximal RC occlusion. So, what about free wall rupture? Remember, free wall rupture is typically seen in anterior wall MI. A transmural, in fact, Typically an anterior wall MI, occlusion of a poorly collateralized LAD. Remember, this was an inferior wall MI. So, remember, free wall rupture generally presents in profound hypotension. So, 1 in 8 sudden cardiac deaths post MI are due to a free wall rupture. So, you have lysed a patient. Patient is very comfortable. He is lying down. Suddenly, he dies. Okay. This is generally due to a free wall rupture. So, 1 in 8 unexplained sudden cardiac death. You don't know why. The patient is coming to a monitor. He does not show a VT or a VF. He is perfectly stable. Suddenly, immediately dies. 1 in 8 unexpected sudden cardiac deaths post MI are due to a free wall rupture. So, remember free wall rupture is typically seen in anterior wall MIs and this was an inferior wall MI. So, this results in coagulo tamponade. So, not only blood, you have this clotted blood. So, you can see the coagulum here. The coagulum and the blood they together form something called the coagulo tamponade be very very careful of aspirating this because one it's clotted blood it won't come in the syringe the more you aspirate the more it's going to bleed so again you can see a free wall rupture here this is the free wall rupture so you can see a poorly contractile lv the anterior wall is akinetic 
and you can see a puff into the pericardium. This is a free wall rupture. And remember, all roads lead to surgery. If you want to salvage the patient, you need to do a surgery. Take him to the OT immediately. This is our free wall rupture was seen in the OT. You can see that with each contraction, the blood is going to spurt out. So again, remember, with each contraction, blood spurts out. It doesn't take much to cause cardiac tamponade in this patient. So with this background, we'll come to the question. So we are looking at what is the ideal triple therapy in this patient. So remember, I want Novak as my anticoagulant of choice. I want to give aspirin and I want to give clopidogrel. Okay, so prasugrel is out. So option A is wrong. Ticagrel is there. So option B is also wrong. Now we are left with C and D. Remember, so it's clopidogrel plus aspirin plus Novak for one month. That is correct in high risk cases. Clopidogrel plus Novak for one year, that's correct. So this is the correct answer. What about option D? Clopidogrel plus aspirin plus Novak is correct. But you want Clopidogrel plus Novak. It is not aspirin plus Novak. So remember, for high risk cases, you give aspirin plus Clopidogrel plus Novak for one month, followed by Clopidogrel plus Novak for one year. And beyond one year, we prefer Novak. So the answer is option C. So what is the manifestation of fluid overload? Fatigue, anorexia, presyncope and confusion. The answer is pretty clear. Okay, the answer is anorexia. So I don't have a reference for this, but it's a pretty logical conclusion. So fatigue, remember, is a manifestation of low cardiac output. Okay, there can be other causes of fatigue like arrhythmias and all. But generally, it's generally accepted that fatigue is a manifestation of low cardiac output. Presyncope can be due to many causes. One of them is an LV outflow tract obstruction. Confusion is basically due to any cause having a decreased uh, CNS perfusion. So basically, the answer is anorexia. Now, why? See, what happens is when you have uh, uh, volume overload, whether it be due to renal, whether it be due to cardiac, whether it be due to liver causes, nephrotic syndrome, whatever, when you have volume overload, you have intestinal wall edema. So you have gut edema. So when your gut is edematous, there is going to be decreased absorption. Okay, decreased absorption. We have postparandial bloating and all of this causes anorexia. So remember your gut wall is edematous with fluid. There's going to be decreased absorption of food. It stays behind. You have postparandial bloating, all those uncomfortable sensations and as a result you develop anorexia. Manifestation of fluid overload, the answer is anorexia. Drug having mortality benefit in HFRF, again explained numerous amounts of times. The answer is MRI or aldosterone receptor antagonist. Remember your four pillars of FRF management. They are MRI, ARNI, beta blocker, SGLT2 inhibitors. All your patients should be on these four drugs unless contraindicated. So MRI, ARNI, beta blocker and SGLT2 inhibitor. They have strong mortality as well as uh, symptomatic benefits also. So with this the answer is aldosterone receptor antagonist. Non-DH PRCCBs, no Digoxin, no mortality benefit. Nitrate, no mortality benefit. So these four the drugs are the ones with a strong mortality benefit and every patient should be on these four drugs unless contraindicated. So remember, this was a trial which showed uh, ideal therapy versus conventional therapy. So a person was on ARNI, beta blocker, MRA and SGLT2, the ideal combination versus your conventional therapy. Just give them ACE and beta blocker. Look at the survival benefit. This patient gained 6.3 years of survival. So a 55 year old, if you prescribe optimal therapy, gains six, nearly 6 and a half years of additional life. And that is tremendous. So you are giving the person 10% more of life. So 55 year old gains 6.3 years of additional life with optimal management instead of your conventional management. That is why the importance of prescribing guideline directed medical therapy in HFREF and at the correct doses. So post CABG patient with serum creatinine of 1.1. So he is having HFREF. Patient has claudication pain. Which drug will you add to decrease risk of hospitalization? So again, the there is either canagliflozin or empagliflozin. These are your two SGLT2 inhibitors. So liraglutide and pyoglutazone have not shown any benefit in hospitalization or mortality benefit. So you have to either give cana or empagliflozin. But again, how do you distinguish? Again, look at the claudication pain. So you can see all your contraindications have been taught. One of the contraindications is risk factors for foot amputation. So a patient has claudication. So analyzing the canvas trial. So this was the canvas trial for canagliflozin. You can see a 1.97, nearly a two-fold risk of increased risk of amputation. 
This was seen with canagliflozin, not with empagliflozin. So it is a property exclusively of canagliflozin. You had nearly a two-fold higher risk of amputation in vulnerable patients. So again, there was no clear-cut mechanism. We do not know why canagliflozin increased the risk, but this was an observation in this uh, trial, canvas trial. Hence, with this, the answer is clearly it is empagliflozin. So it's either cana or empagliflozin. Since this patient has claudication, and since the canvas trial with canagliflozin showed a two-fold increase in risk of amputation, we would like to give empagliflozin in this patient. So the empareg outcome again showed no differences in amputation rates between uh, patients on therapy as well as placebo. So this was a trial. This was a property unique to the canagliflozin molecule. This is not seen in the empagliflozin molecule. So if the patient is at increased risk of uh, amputation, do not prescribe canagliflozin. Patient on acinimeter switched to be switched to ARNI. What is the time gap required? Again, a pretty simple question. 36 hours. We have covered this extensively. So again, these are indications of ARNI from my slide. If patient is on ACE or ARB, switch to ARNI after a 36 hour washout. You give a 36 hour washout in order to wash out all your drugs and so you can start ARNI after that. So remember 36 hours is your washout period. Do not go and start ARNI the next day. 36 hours is your washout period. Again for my slides. Again, paradigm heart failure is a, land, it's a landmark trial. You can see that I compared Enlapril with ARNI. You can see around a, 20, around a 6, there's a huge mortality benefit. You can see around 0 0.000002 and the number needed to treat is 21. I have told you that uh, paradigm heart failure is a 20% trial. Everything revolves around 20. So your number needed to treat was 21. You can see 16% added benefit with uh, nepralysin inhibition. So everything is around 20. Benefit of cardiovascular death decreased by 20%. Heart failure hospitalization decreased by 20%. Mortality nearly 20%. Heart failure and death 20%. Sudden death 20%. So paradigm heart failure is a 20% trial. Almost everything revolves around the number 20. So now we come to the next question. A young male comes to the OPD with history of nocturnal angina and grade 3 dyspnea. A lot of story is given. He is seen by a doctor who then identifies a sign, makes a diagnosis of valvular heart disease, referred to a senior doctor. So basically valvular heart disease. Nocturnal angina is seen in which valvular heart disease? It is seen in aortic regurgitation. So remember, when you sleep, you have bradycardia. Bradycardia increases the duration of diastole. Hence, you have more aortic regurgitation, more blood is stolen away from the coronaries. This results in angina. So when you have, when you sleep, you have bradycardia. This increases diastole. AR is a diastolic murmur. So there is going to be increase in AR. More blood is stolen away from the coronaries. So it leaks back from the aorta to the LV. More blood is stolen away from the coronaries. This results in angina. This is the mechanism for nocturnal angina. So sleep, bradycardia, bradycardia increases the duration of diastole. There is going to be more volume of blood regurgitated, stolen away from the coronaries, resulting in angina. So again, we are looking for AR. Patient has dyspnea. This indicates that the LV has failed. Dyspnea is seen in AR only once the LV has failed. Okay, so again, MR, C and D are wrong options because we are not looking for AR. Does AR have an LV S4? No, AR is characterized by an LV S3. So you have AR, hollow diastolic murmur and hill sign. This is the answer. The answer is AR. You're looking for AR. Hollow diastolic murmur indicates a long, uh, basically a very severe AR and hill sign is basically a peripheral sign. So can MR be associated with an LVS4? Generally, chronic MR is associated with an LVS3. If you have acute MR, this can have LVS4. So a chronic MR, LVS3. If the MR is significant, anything more than a moderate MR produces an S3 and an MDM. If it is a acute MR, you can have a S4. MR having an ESM, again, this is a PSM. MR causes a pansystolic murmur and MR doesn't cause Corrigan sign. So again, that's wrong. So AR, horodiastolic murmur, hill sign is your right answer. Which of the following causes no reflow? It is not a cause of no reflow. Distal embolization, vasospasm, residual stenosis and reperfusion injury. So all day I have taught you this. What is no reflow? It is basically open epicardial coronary arteries. Closed microvasculature.
So your epicardial coronary arteries are no lesions. The blood flow is clean. The but uh, the vessels are clean, but the microvasculature is all occluded. That's what causes no reflow. I'll explain to you why. Again, this is my diagram here. So you can see here you have a very tight lesion in the LAD in the LAD, a very tight lesion. So what do we do when we do it? When we uh, see a tight lesion, you can see the stent is deployed here. Once the stent is deployed, there is no flow. This is called as no reflow phenomenon. So you can see that uh, there is a very 99% tight lesion in the LAD, but there is distal flow. The moment I have deployed a stent, there is completely no flow. What has happened here? All the thrombus which is present here has gone distally, plugged the microvasculature. So your microvasculature is completely occluded by thrombus with certain degree of vasospasm. This causes no flow. Your coronary artery is opened. You have stented the coronary artery. There is no more lesion. But your microvasculature is full of thrombotic debris and is in spasm. So how do you treat this? You can give antithrombotics like ticagrelol like tyrofiban, you can give uh, vasodilators like adenosine, nitroprusside and all those. So again, what would be the answer in this case? Dislambization. Yes, it is a cause of no reflow. The moment you stand, the thrombus gets squeezed out and goes distally and plugs all your microvasculature. Vasospasm. Yes, the two main constituents are vasospasm and thrombotic plugging of the microvasculature. Reperfusion injury. Yes, it is one of the types of reperfusion injury. The answer is residual stenosis. Remember, open epicardial coronary arteries. The coronary artery should be open. The microvasculature should be closed. If you have a residual stenosis, the loss of flow may be due to the residual stenosis. You need to tackle that. So open epicardial coronary arteries. The epicardial coronary artery should be normal. Your microvasculature should be closed. Hence, the answer is residual stenosis. Remember, the pathology should be in the microvasculature, not the coronary artery, epicardial coronary artery. True regarding hepatojugular reflux, again straight from my slides, the answer is PCWPF greater than 15. Again, you have discussed uh, a lot on hepatojugular reflux. You can see the module basics of heart failure. So, hepatojugular reflux, the patient is asked to lie at 30 degrees. His head tilted at 45 degrees to the left. Breathe quietly through the mouth to avoid valsalva. Press abdomen for 10 seconds. Your normal response is your JVP elevates less than 3 centimeter. And your rice lasts less than 10 seconds. Again, you have described all of this. This is your standard clinical cardiology. An abnormal hepatojugular reflux or an abnormal jugular reflux is a more than 3 cm rice or if the rice lasts for more than 15 seconds. So your causes are basically something to do with the RV. So RV dysfunction, occult CCP, tricuspid stenosis. If the RV is normal, then it indicates PCWPF more than 15. So remember, it basically deals with something with the RV. If your RV is normal, then it indicates an elevated PCWPF more than 15. Again, all of this have been discussed. So apply pressure of at least 10 seconds. This is wrong. It's not a transient abdominal compression. You have to actually give it for more than 10 seconds. Breath sounds should not be held. You need to avoid valsalva. So this is also wrong. So indicates a PCWPF more than 15. It basically indicates an RV pathology. If the RV is normal, then it indicates an elevated PCWP. Gene in involved in Marfan syndrome. Again, a pretty basic question. Again, there are many genes in Marfan syndrome. The most common is fibrillin 1. So, nothing to explain about this. So, now we come to the next question. Patient has normal BP on office reading. Home based BP reading is 150-90. 24 hour ambulatory BP is elevated. What is your true statement? So, we are dealing with mast hypertension. Okay. So, again, home BP is elevated. Office BP is normal. This is a typical case of mast hypertension. So true about mass hypertension, ABPM is not useful. This is a false statement. It is diagnosed by ABPM. Less common in patients who are not on medication. This is false. It is more common in patients who are on medication. I'll explain. Good prognosis is false. Remember, it has a bad prognosis. Mass hypertension and white coat hypertension have a worse prognosis when compared to normal tensor individuals. Endorgan damage is more common. Yes, this is a true statement. Mass hypertension has more endorgan damage when compared to normotensive individuals. So, I'll, this is the only controversial point. I'll explain to you why. This is especially of great relevance. So, mass hypertension is more commonly seen when patient is on a short-acting antihypertensive. You know, as my professor used to say, sometimes your home atmosphere is much more stressful. So, you can have high BP at home. But this is your typical reason. More commonly seen when a patient is on a short-acting antihypertensive. So, hydrochlorothiazide has a half-life of 6 to 8 hours. CTD or chlorothaldone has a half-life of 60 hours. Let's say a patient is on hydrochlorothiazide, 12.5 milligram, 100, 
Another patient is on CTD 12.5 milligram 100. So how is it different? So let's say a patient takes hydrochlorothiazide in the morning. So red is hydrochlorothiazide. When he takes hydrochlorothiazide in the morning, say around 6 a.m. Okay. When does he visit your OP? He visits your OP somewhere between 10 o'clock to 2 a.m. So you can see your 10 o'clock to 2 a.m. Your BP values are actually low. So 10 o'clock to 2 a.m. When he visits your OP, remember XCT has a half life of 6 to 8 hours. So he takes it early in the morning. When he visits your clinic, his BP values are low. But remember short half life. When he goes home and especially at night, your BP shoots up. So again, because he's taking a short targeting hypertensive, you have actually converted a sustained hypertension into a masked hypertension. Why? Takes a tablet in the morning. Early morning BP is controlled when he visits your clinic. Late night BP is high. So you have converted a sustained hypertension into a masked hypertension. Let's take chlorothaldon. Chlorothaldon has a half-life of how much? 60 hours. So if he takes it here, you can see the BP values are, are, are controlled even at night. This is the reason why. So always that's why you prefer chlorothaldone over hydrochlorothiazide. Hydrochlorothiazide or any short acting antihypertensive converts sustained hypertension into masked hypertension. So your patients as well as your physicians have a false sense of security. So always ask patient to check BP in evening. Go to your nearby clinic, nearby nurse, have a BP apparatus at home, check your BP in the evening. Late night to early morning BP is poorly controlled by hydrochlorothiazide. This is what I have just explained. That's why I said it is more common in patients who are on medication, especially short acting medications like hydrochlorothiazide. So patient comes for follow up post iatic valve replacement. He is suspected to have patient processes mismatch. What indexed aortic valve area would be confirmatory? Again, this is something I have explained. It's just 0.85. Again, prosthetic heart valve is a topic we have selectively taught you. These are the complications of prosthetic valve. Again, my slide. You can look. Patient prosthetic mismatch. Index EOA. 0.85 in the aortic valve. 1.2 in the mitral valve. That's why I have already taught you this. I have just taught you this particular point on patient process mismatch. So, point, less than 0.85 in the aortic valve. Less than 1.2 in the mitral valve. In this case, your answer is 0.85. Marfan's patient has descending thoracic aortic aneurysm of more than 4.1 cm. So remember the value 4.1 cm. Next course of action. So you can read the options. The answer is annual CT with beta blockers intervene when the rate of growth is more than 1 cm per year. So I'll just go again, you know, Marfan's syndrome, the aorta is vulnerable. It can go in for dissections, can go in for aneurysms, root dilation, all those things. You have an aortopathy. In Marfan's and familial thoracic aortic syndromes, if the aorta, descending thoracic aorta is more than 6 cm, we are talking about descending thoracic aorta, more than 6 cm, straight away go for repair. Whether it's open repair, whether it's stavar, it's your choice. More than 6 cm, absolutely no question, go for repair. 5 to 6 cm, consider repair, it's a grey zone. So 5 to 6 cm, consider repair. Less than 5 cm, generally it's medical management with either beta blockers or ARB, losata. Remember, it's not both. It's either beta blockers or ARB. Why ARB? Because TGF beta plays a very important role in the pathogenesis of Marfan's and ARBs are anti-TGF beta. Again, this was asked in INSS, that's why. So remember, 6 cm repair, 5 to 6 cm gray area, consider repair, less than 5 cm, do not repair, prescribe beta blockers and ARB. What are the exceptions? If the patient has a rapidly expanding aortic diameter, so again you can see, Rapid rate of growth, more than 1 cm per year. Family history of premature artery dissection and presence of more than mild MR. So, these are the exceptions why you repair even if the aneurysm is less than 5 cm. So, rapid rate of growth, more than 1 cm per year. History of artery dissection and presence of more than mild MR. If it's 4.5 to, to 5 cm, just do annual or biannual imaging. If it is 3.5 to 4.4 cm, annual imaging. So this is how you manage Marfan syndromes presenting thoracic aneurysm. So 6 cm repair, 5 to 6 cm, 5 to 6 cm gray area, less than 5 cm prescribe beta blockers or uh, ARBs and there are certain indications why you want to repair and less than 4.5 just go for imaging. So with this the answer is annual CT you have to prescribe either a beta blocker or an ARB intervene when the rate of growth is more than 1 cm per year. Again, this is your standard answer. So, patient with multiple episodes of diarrhea, potassium of less than 2.2, so severe hypokalemia, 
what is the most plausible change in the ECG in case of severe hypokalemia? So again, what does this plausible mean? It actually means reasonable. So your Oxford dictionary, it actually means reasonable. So again, what is the manifestation of hypokalemia on the ECG? It is U wave. If somebody asks you what is the manifestation of hypokalemia, you say U wave. Okay, hypokalemia causes an increase in height of P wave. Hypokalemia causes QT, it causes QU prolongation or apparent QT prolongation. Okay, it's apparent QT prolongation. Why? Because the T wave, the U wave is going to increase. The T wave and the U wave merge together. So you have a QU prolongation or an apparent QT prolongation. It's not that the QT is prolonged. The U wave is increased and the T and the U merge together. So you have an apparent QT prolongation, actually a QU prolongation. And again, J waves are pretty rare in hypokalemia. It's mainly hypercalcemia and uh, hypothermia which causes J waves. Again, the most common manifestation, it is, hypo, it is uh, U waves. Again, this is hypokalemia. You can see that the U wave has become more prominent. The T wave inverts. Okay. So, it is the QU interval which prolongs. So, you might think it is a QT interval. It is an apparent QT prolongation, but actually it is a QU interval which prolongs. So, you can see the QU interval prolonging. So, again, hypokalemia causes ST depression. Hyperkalemia causes uh, your prominent T waves. So, hypokalemia causes T wave inversion, hyperkalemia causes prominent T wave. So, somebody pushing the T wave, somebody pulling the T wave up. We go to the next question. Patient with crescent or decrescent or murmur heard in the left sternal area with asymmetrical septal hypertrophy, LVOT gradient of more than 30 millimeters. The intensity of the murmur increases by. So, again, this is an extremely, extremely controversial question. Again, this has two answers it is Valsalva and standing. Now we are taught since second year MBBS, the murmurs of HCM and MVPMR increase on standing and Valsalva. So among this, if you ask me which is the right answer, again, I would prefer Valsalva. But again, if, if even if you say standing, it's very difficult to argue against it. So again, this is a statement from Braunwald. Again, I want you to read this particular point. Two exceptions are the systolic murmur of HOCM which becomes louder. And that of MVP which becomes longer and often louder. That's why I said I prefer Valsalva. So again, even if you write standing or even if you write Valsalva, both in my opinion are correct. It's my individual preference that I prefer Valsalva. So again, there's a standard DM and uh, exam question. When you go for your practicals, this is asked to me also. How do you distinguish the murmur of uh, HOCM and MVP MR in Valsalva? So... HOCM murmur increases in intensity on Valsalva. MVP MR increases in duration on Valsalva. Again, this is a DM Feindler exam question. Again, there are no right answers for this question. So, both Valsalva and standing are equally correct. Just because you find that often louder statement in Braunwald, I prefer Valsalva. I want you to also know this particular point. We go to the next question. So, 55 year old male post EABG two years back on rosuvastatin, 40 milligram OD, triglycerides, total cholesterol high, LDL 110 high, triglycerides high, HDL low. What drug do you prescribe next? So, patient is on high dose statin. So, rosuvastatin 40 is high dose. He is still having LDL high. He is a post CABG patient. What drug will you prescribe next? The answer is acetamide, absolutely no doubt. So, again, this is my exact slides. So, this is what I told you. If the patient has clinical or atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, your target is 55. LDL target is 55 according to the ESC guidelines. And how do you manage it? You first start with statins, high dose statins. If the LDL target is not achieved, you go in for azetimibe. If the LDL target is still not achieved, you go in for PCSK9 inhibitors. This is your flow, this is your target. So, what is your target? Your target is an LDL of 55. And how do you achieve it? You give high potency statins. In this case, the patient is already on Rosewa statin 40. If the target is not achieved, you go for azetimibe. If the target is not achieved still, you go for PCSK9 inhibitors. So again, with this, the answer is azetimibe. Now, there were some students who said that uh, we should straight away go in for PCSK9 because azetimibe reduces the LDL only by 18%. So we are not going to achieve the targets. So we should straight away go for PCSK9 inhibitors. Again, but remember, 
people some cardiologists do follow this they don't give acetamide they straight away go for pcsk9 but the guidelines are pretty clear in all patients statin first acetamide 2 pcsk3 individual people can practice differently so this is from the esc guidelines for secondary prevention so this patient remember has cabg patients at a very high risk not achieving their goal on maximum tolerated dose of statin and acetamide so patient should be on statin and acetamide you add pcsk9 inhibitor it's a class 1a recommendation so statin first acetamide 2 then go for pcsk9 inhibitor do not straight away go for a pcsk9 inhibitor people may practice differently but this is what your guidelines is so now we come to the next question male patient non cascading granuloma lung with erythema nodosum what are we dealing with we are dealing with sarcoid patient has had syncope why does syncope occur in sarcoid syncope can occur due to bradyarrhythmias as well as tachyarrhythmias so it can go into complete heart block or a vtvf halter shows nsvt so we are probably dealing with a vtvf so sarcoidosis syncope probably due to a vt okay vf unlikely because it seldom reverts so sarcoidosis probably due to and with a syncope probably due to a vt so this patient already has an event so this patient requires an icd and it is due to for secondary prevention remember event has already occurred this patient has already suffered a syncope so it's no more primary prevention it is secondary prevention and what is the next step the next step is cmr okay the answer is cmr ace and secondary icd so this is the chart which i taught you suspected sarcoid the first step is cmr okay and after that you can go in for pet scan the first step is always cmr even if you look at brown wall they focus exclusively on cmr even the nuclear imaging chapter they highlight cmr over pet so cmr is obviously your next step so the answer is cmr with ace obviously and it is secondary prevention why because an event like syncope has already happened answer is cmr ace and icd for secondary prevention remember in a sarcoid patient with syncope always be hesitant to put in a pacemaker why because sarcoidosis can have both bradyarrhythmias as well as tachyarrhythmias so if you put in a pacemaker when the patient goes in for vt this pacemaker is going to be useless so always put in an icd when the patient goes in for vt it will shock when the patient goes in for bradyarrhythmia it will act as a pacemaker so always put in icd so we so we come to the next question anterior wall stemi 3 days ago now patient is asymptomatic cad showed ld completely occluded what is your next step the answer is medical management i'll tell you why so in every patient you obviously want to do primary bci and it's much more preferred than thrombolysis so when the patient is less than 12 hours of 12 hours you can straight away go for a primary pci no doubt about it this is a class 1 recommendation 12 to 48 hours you can still go in for primary pci this is called as primary pci strategy this is as per the brave 2 trial okay it's a class 2 a recommendation as per the brave 2 trial more than 48 hours you don't do it as per the oat trial so class 3 as per the oat trial so less than 12 hours it's a class 1 recommendation do a primary pci 12 to 48 hours you can do a primary pci strategy as per the brave 2 trial it's a class 2 a recommendation and more than 48 hours do not do it as per the oat trial what is oat occluded artery trial so again this is the same chart which i have explained so you can see here primary pci can done from 0 to 12 hours it's a class 1 recommendation from 12 hours to 48 hours it is a class 2a recommendation as per the brave 2 trial even for stable patients now if the patient is sick he is hemodynamically unstable he is electrically unstable he is having ongoing pain you can do the pca whenever you want there is no actual upper limit for it but in hemodynamic in stable patients this patient is quietly lying down he has no symptoms it is a class 2a recommendation to do a pca up to 48 hours as per the brave 2 trial beyond 48 hours do not do as per the oat trial it's a class 3 recommendation so it's very important so this patient presents to you three days after the event do not do it just do medical management so why did we do an angiogram so remember the patient can have other lesions so lad is totally occluded he might have a circumflex lesion he might have an rca lesion you can still stent those lesions so treat the other lesions not the lad lesion 
Now, suppose you want to treat the LED radiation, what do you do? You do a viability study. So, what do we usually do is we do a cardiac MRI, demonstrate viability in the LED territory and then do the PCA. So, if you want to stent the culprit vessel beyond 48 hours, you must do a viability study like a cardiac MRI or a WT means whatever. Do a viability study and then only you stent that particular lesion. Otherwise, do not stent. Inverted P in lead 1 and AVL is seen in situs saltus, dextrocardia with situs saltus, dextrocardia with situs inversus, mesocardia. Again, this is a bit of a confusing question for some, but uh, I'll explain it. See, what is dextrocardia? Okay. And what is levocardia? If the apex is towards the left, it is levocardia. You need not even look at the orientation of cardiac chambers. The LA, RA, the LV, RV might be in whatever orientation. It does not matter. Apex pointing towards the left, this is levocardia. Apex pointing towards the right, this is dextrocardia. You need not even look at the chambers. So, apex towards the left, levocardia. Apex towards the right, dextrocardia. What about situs? Situs describes the position of cardiac atria and viscera. Cardiac situs is determined by atrial location. So, you look at how the atria is oriented. Don't look at the apex. Okay. So, LA in the left, RA in the right. This is situs solitus. Okay. We are talking about cardiac situs, right? RA in the left, LA in the right. So, RA in the left, LA in the right. This is situs inversus. Again, we are talking cardiac situs. Okay. So, we are not looking at the uh, apex. So, we are only looking at the atria. So, LA in the left, RA in the right. This is situs solitus. We are talking about cardiac situs. LA, LA in the right, RA in the left. This is situs inversus. We are talking about cardiac situs. Okay. So, let us look at this. This is levocardia. LA is on the left, RA is on the right. This is levocardia plus situs solitus. This is levocardia, LA is on the right, RA is on the left, this is situs inversus. Okay. So, this is apex is towards the right, this is dextrocardia, LA is on the left, RA is on the right, this is situs solitus. This is dextrocardia, L RA is on the left, LA is on the right, this is situs inversus. So, I hope you got this uh, in your mind. So, dextrocardia look only at the apex, situs look only at the atria. Okay. So, once you have understood this, we will go in for the next. This is your cardiac axis. Your This is your RA will be here, your LA will be here, your LV will be here, your RV will be here, roughly. Where is the SA node? SA node is situated somewhere here. So, when we talk about, we are talking about 1 and AVL. The impulse from the SA node goes towards 1 and AVL. So, your P wave will be positive. So, the impulse is coming like this. So, your P wave will be positive. 2, 3 AVF will also be positive. Why? The impulse is coming towards the left and down. So, your P, in 2, 3 AVF also P wave is going to be positive. So, because your impulse comes from the SA node towards 1 and AVL, P is going to be positive. Because it comes down towards 2, 3 AVF, P is going to be positive. This is normal. Now, how can the P wave be negative? So, the impulse should be coming from LA from this side going towards this side. Okay. How can this happen? Either the LA can be the pacemaker. This is called as left atrial rhythm or coronary sinus rhythm. So, if the LA is the pacemaker, not the RA, the impulse can go towards the right. So, this is called as left atrial rhythm or coronary sinus rhythm. The other way is you can have the chambers being switched. So, the RA comes here, the LA comes here. So, you have some sort of situs inversus. Now, the impulse goes away from one and AVL. The two ways you can get a negative wave are, one is the LA can be the pacemaker or the RA and LA can switch positions or you can have situs inversus. This is normal. You can see that uh, two, one and AVL are positive, impulse comes like this. Two, three AVFP is positive, impulse comes like this. So, again, Let's say you have dextrocardia with uh, situs uh, inverses. Remember, impulse starts from here. The RA SA node is going to be here. It goes towards away from one and AVL. So you have inverted P waves. So suppose you have dextrocardia with situs solitus. It does not happen. Why? The RA is still here. So I hope you understand that point. So the answer here is dextrocardia with situs inverses. Okay. 
So that's why they want you to know what the meaning of dextrocardia and situs saltus and inverses is. Remember, you need the RA and LA to be flipped over. You need mirror image events. So the PA is inverted in 1 and AVL if you have a left atrial rhythm or if the LA and RA switch sides. So it is basically some sort of situs inverses. Here we are talking about cardiac situs. So patient presents 24 hours after MI has a pan-systolic murmur at lower left sternal border, BP is 70-40. What is our diagnosis? Again, pan-systolic murmur at lower left sternal border. It's clearly a ventricular septal rupture. Nothing to explain. Okay. So again, this is how uh, this is the case which we had discussed in our videos. 65-year-old anterior wall MI within window period, loud systolic thrill over lower left sternal border. This is a this is the ventricular septal rupture here. Again, when you have an MI, if you get a new onset loud thrill, murmur with thrill. It's a ventricular septal rupture, a very deadly complication. You can see the VSR here. So again, 1 to 3 percent, bimodal peak, elderly female. We all de dealt with this. Please look at the videos. We, we, so rupture occurs at junction of infarcted and non-infarcted tissues. Again, very high mortality rate. The patient should be taken for surgery immediately. Now, uh, people are trying, when, um, I mean, are trying closure percutaneously. But generally, it is a surgeon's domain. So we come to the next question, 30 year old patient presents with shortness of breath, regurgitation volume 65, regurgitation fraction 50, vena contractor 0.7, EROA 40. What is the diagnosis? Mild MR, moderate MR, asymptomatic severe MR, symptomatic severe MR. The answer is very clear, it is symptomatic severe MR. So what you can do is you, you can even strike out these particular points. So I can even strike out all this regurgitation volume, regurgitation fraction, all this. It's not needed. Remember, this patient has Disney as a symptom. Okay. Remember that mild MR, moderate MR have no symptoms. Chronic severe MR. If the patient has normal LV function and is in sinus rhythm, has only two symptoms. They are fatigue due to loss of cardiac output and palpitations due to volume overload of LV. Dyspnea is not a symptom of chronic severe MR with normal LV function. Please remember that. Dyspnea indicates LV failure. And in LV failure only occurs in a chronic, in severe chronic MR. So please know, this is symptomatic severe MR. So mild MR, no symptoms, moderate MR, no symptoms. The patient has dyspnea. It indicates that the LV has failed. So this is severe MR with LV failure. So this is symptomatic severe MR. So again, this is your classification. Remember, my at risk and progress. These are mild and moderate MR, no symptoms. Asymptomatic MR, although they give you no symptoms, remember fatigue and palpitation are two symptoms. See, symptomatic severe MR has exertional dyspnea and decreased L exercise tolerance. Please remember that. Only the dyspnea is a manifest dyspnea in AR or dyspnea in MR indicates LV failure. Very bad prognostic sign. Okay. So again, this is symptomatic severe MR. You need not even look at the other echocardiographic criteria. So please remember, very simple question. So MR with dyspnea is equal to uh, MR with LV failure. Naiha class 3 dyspnea, bilateral clefts, EF of 50%, EDV 3, 300 ml, residual uh, uh, reagent volume 75 ml. So chronic compensated AR, chronic decompensated AR, acute severe AR, chronic compensated MR. So remember, the patient has dyspnea, he has bilateral crepes, so we are dealing with some sort of acute pulmonary edema. EF is 50%, EDV is 300%, so ED, LV is enlarged. So your normal endostatic volume is around 120, your LV is enlarged. So again, is it chronic compensated AR? No. Remember, AR or MR, dyspnea indicates LV failure. So it is not chronic compensated AR. Is it chronic compensated MR? No. The LV has failed. If the patient has dyspnea, whether it is MR or whether it is AR, it indicates LV failure, a bad prognostic sign. Now we are left with two options, chronic decompensated AR and acute severe AR. Remember the LV is enlarged. Acute severe AR, the LV does not have time to enlarge. So the answer is chronic decompensated AR. Okay. So again, patient has uh, basically has some valvular heart lesion, regurgitant lesion with a dyspnea patients in pulmonary edema. It is not chronic compensated AR or chronic compensated MR because dyspnea indicates LV failure. So you are left with two options, chronic decompensated AR and acute severe AR. The LV has enlarged. 
Acute AR, the LV does not enlarge. The answer is chronic decompensated AR. How does acute severe AR present? He presents in cardiogenic shock. Pulmonary edema is a rare manifestation of acute AR. Acute severe AR presents with cardiogenic shock. Pulmonary edema is rare. Acute severe MR presents to you in acute pulmonary edema. Please remember that. So, acute severe MR presents to you in pulmonary edema. Acute severe AR presents to you with shock. I'll tell you why. So, again, the same chart here. Symptomatic severe MR. Dyspnea is only seen in symptomatic severe MR. Indicates LV failure. So, acute AR is a surgical emergency. Patient presents to you with cardiogenic shock. This is very important. Less chance of pulmonary edema. Why is there less chance of pulmonary edema? So, this is your normal. This is a patient having acute AR. So, what has happened here? You can look at the BP here. The LV end diastolic pressure is increased. Why is it increased? Because it has two outlets. One outlet is coming from the aorta. One outlet is filling from the LA. So, the LV is filled from two sources. One from the aorta and one from the LA. That is why your diastolic pressure is increased. And this causes LV failure. Okay, the LV fails, there is no forward flow, this patient goes in for cardiogenic shock. Okay, so what has happened? The LV is filling with two sources, one from the aorta, one from the LA. Your LV end diastolic pressure increases. The LV is not dilated. Please remember the LV does not have time to dilate. So the LV fails. And the, when the LV fails, remember what happens? Whatever, already the, there is poor anti-grade flow. And whatever is going anti-grade is coming back into the LV. This patient goes in for cardiogenic shock. Why does this patient not go in for pulmonary edema? So remember in every patient, the LV EDP is equal to the LA pressure equal to the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. But in this case, you look, the LV EDP is 50. The LA pressure is 20. What has happened here? There is so much blood in the LV that it closes the mitral valve. The blood, excess blood in the LV causes premature closure of the mitral valve. So you have premature mitral valve closure. So that is that is why that this is a protective mechanism, and that is why acute severe AR presents with cardiogenic shock. Remember, the LV has failed. There is poor anti-grade flow, and whatever blood flow goes anti-grade comes back due to AR. Patient goes in for shock. The patient rarely goes in for pulmonary edema due to a premature closure of mitral valve. How does acute MR present? He presents in pulmonary edema. This is an essential difference. Acute AR presents with cardiogenic shock. LV failure is rare because of a premature closure of mitral valve. Acute MR causes pulmonary edema. Young African male, history of multiple myeloma, presents with history of syncope. So his brother is having history of sudden cardiac death. On evaluation, low voltage complexes are seen on ECG. Echo shows biventricular hypertrophy. Speckled imaging shows apical sparing. What is the diagnosis? Absolutely no doubt this is amyloidosis. Okay. So again, in my videos, I've already told you how do you find out amyloidosis? The two classical presentations. ECG shows low voltage. Echo shows LVH. Discordance. ECG showing LVH. Echo. ECG showing low voltage complexes. Echo is showing LVH. There is a discordance. ECG shows antro inferior wall MI, but echo shows no RWMI. These are your two classical ECG presentations. So again, you can have a look here. So ECG shows low voltage complexes, but echo shows LVH. Again, you can see the discordance. ECG low voltage complexes, echo LVH. Another presentation, you can see ECG showing anterior wall plus inferior wall MI. Do the echo, you find no RWMI another classical presentation okay so these are your two presentations strain echo you can see a cherry red spot why this is due to apical sparing this is a cherry red spot due to apical sparing so your apex contracts well your base contracts poorly so again we have discussed all these points so you can see the low voltage complexes, you can see the biventricular hypertrophy, you can see the speckled image showing apical sparring. 8 year old newborn who is dusky and floppy, the heart rate of 200, respiratory rate of 80, BP of 40, 20, pulse is recordable but feeble, EC is showing AVRT, you have narrow complex QRS alternance and pre-excitation. 
what is the next line of management? So this is basically an SVT and the patient is in shock. And what is the line of management? It is DC shock. Do not give any antiarrhythmic. Remember, if the patient is electrically, if the patient has hemodynamic instability or shock, there is only one treatment. You have to restore the patient to sinus rhythm as fast as possible. And your most effective measure is to give a DC shock. It does not matter whether it is SVT, whether it is VT, whether it is VF. Whatever the arrhythmia, if the arrhythmia is causing hemodynamic instability, the only treatment is give a DC shock. The most effective therapy, the therapy with the least side effects, the therapy which is least commonly also used is a DC shock. So remember, whatever the arrhythmia, if the arrhythmia is causing hemodynamic instability, there is only one treatment which is a DC shock. And what does DC shock do? DC shock stops all electrical activity of heart, both normal as well as abnormal. It gives a chance for the normal activity to take over. So DC shock st stops all electrical activity of the heart, both normal as well as abnormal and gives a chance for the normal activity to take over. So the answer is DC shock. So we come to the next question. Mitral prosthetic valve stenosis true is. So they given you a lot of options. The answer is DVF less than 2.5. Again, this is a higher level question. This is a DM question for you. Again, they have asked you this question. So again, remember, these are landmine questions. You can even leave these questions alone. Again, this is based on prosthetic valve echocardiography. So unless you are a DM candidate who is doing echocardiographies for prosthetic valves, you don't study these points. I don't expect you to also remember these points. So if they ask you next year a straight repeat question, you can answer this. Otherwise, I would recommend that you don't study these prosthetic valve findings. There are so many things to study in cardiology. You cannot sit and study everything. So again, a higher level question. This is a landmine question. I would prefer you leave these questions alone. Asprenia syndrome associated with which anomaly? Now again, this is a question which is very confusing. I don't know whether the options I've got are also correct. So interrupted IVC with azygous continuation. This is classically of polysplenia syndromes or left atrial isomerism. Okay. So TAPVC less common than PAPVC. TAPVC is seen in more than 80% of asplenia syndromes. DORV less than TGA. DORV is seen in 80% of asplenia. TGA is seen in 70% of uh, TGS. Dextrocardia is seen in 40% of asplenia. Levocardia is seen in 60% of asplenia. The answer is dextrocardia less common than levocardia. I am not sure whether I have got the options correctly because I find it uh, difficult to believe that they will ask you a word like TAPVC less common, DORV less common. It is very difficult for me to believe. But if this was the option, it is a pretty idiotic question. Okay, Because again, uh, the answer is dextrocardia less common than levocardia but it is very difficult to learn things like this. Okay, Know that TAPV is 80%, DORV is 80%, TGA is 70%. It is difficult to learn these things. So young male smoker with a history of anterior wall MI, CAG of less than shows a less than 50 percentage, drop is elevated. So we are dealing with minoca, MI with normal or non-obstructive coronary arteries. So less than 50 percentage, drop elevated anterior wall MI. So this basically indicates a minoca. So is it, so you are dealing with two options, minoca or takasubo. So it is a young male, takasubo is typically seen in middle aged females. So the answer is minoca. The cause could be either arterial dissection or spasm. Since it's a young male smoker, I would think of spasm. So young male smoker, anterior wall MI, CAG showing non-obstructive coronaries, drop elevation. We are dealing with a minoca situation. And remember, Takasuba is seen in elderly middle-aged females. So next question, one week old child, congenital moderate MR, what is the cause? So they are basically asking you the cause of congenital MR. Again, a DM level question. I don't expect uh, MDPGs to know. So I finished my DM. I have never heard of anyone asking the causes of congenital MR. I have also not studied the causes of congenital MR till now. The answer is excess mitral tissue. I will explain to you why. This is a statement from Braunwald. The what is the cause of isolated congenital MR? The most common cause is an AV canal defect. This is followed by dysplastic pulmonary valve, a dysplastic mitral valve. So your number one cause of congenital MR is an AV canal defect. That is logical. We have seen cleft mitral leaflet causing uh, AMR. The second most common cause is the dysplastic mitral valve. And what does a dysplastic mitral valve mean? It basically means excess tissue in the mitral valve, myxomatous degeneration, something similar to mitral prolapse. So again, remember, 
Well, first common cause is an AV canal defect followed by a dysplastic mitral valve. Dysplastic mitral valve is basically a thickened immobile valve leaflets with mixer mantis degeneration. So again, here the answer is excess mitral tissue causing a dysplastic mitral valve. Again, difficult to answer these questions. So dysplasia has thick redundant leaflets. Redundant means excess tissue in the leaflets. So we come to the next question. 50 year old male, stage 1 hypertension. ACVD score of less than 10% according to ACCHA which is false. So again salt restriction you will do for any hypertension patient. Increased physical activity you will obviously do. So I left with two options. Start pharmacological treatment or reassess after 3 to 6 months. So again this is your ACCHA guideline. You can see stage 1 hypertension. SBP from 130 to 139 and DBP from 80 to 89. The, if your ASCVD risk is greater than 10% or the patient has clinical cardiovascular disease, then only you start BP medication. Otherwise, you don't start BP medication. So, if you have stage 1 hypertension, according to the ACCAHA guidelines, if the patient has clinical cardiovascular disease or has an ASCVD score greater than 10%, you can start medication. Less than 10%, you only follow up. You can give all sorts of lifestyle measures. So again here, so the patient has ACVD score of less than 10 or you re, your options are, the answer is you do not start pharmacological management. So starting pharmacological management is your wrong statement. So salt restriction, yes. Increase physical activity, yes. Reassess after 3 to 6 months, yes. Since the ACVD score is less than 10%, you only give lifestyle measures. If it's more than 10% or the patient has clinical cardiovascular disease, you can start pharmacological management. So the false statement is start pharmacological management. Cardiorenal syndrome type 1, again it's a pretty basic question. Acute cardiac failure leading to acute kidney injury. So nothing to explain, we have all learned this during our MD days. So type 1 is acute, a, a acute heart failure resulting in acute kidney injury. Type 2 is chronic cardiac dysfunction causing chronic kidney disease. So, we all know about the types of uh, CRS, nothing to explain. So, we will go for the next question. So, pre-excitation more common. Again, I don't know the other options, but obviously the answer is Epstein's. The congenital heart disease which is most frequently associated with pre-excitation is Epstein's. This has been repeated several times. So, why do you develop an accessory? Don't, why don't you develop an accessory pathway? See, you, when you develop, when, during development a fibrous ring, is seen connective is seen in between the atria and ventricle. So you have a fibrous ring on the left side and you have a fibrous ring on the right side. This fibrous ring prevents impulse conduction from the LA from the atria to the ventricle, and the only way an impulse can conduct is through your normal conducting system. So the fibrous ring prevents this. If you have a deficiency in this fibrous ring, this causes an accessory pathway. When you have Epstein's this fibrous this this fibrous ring cannot develop in this part because your tricuspid valve has gone downwards or apically this fibrous ring cannot develop properly in the right side and as a result you have accessory pathways multiple accessory pathways have been described in 18 uh, in Epstein's as many as eight accessory pathways in the same individuals so a fibrous ring is seen between the atria and ventricle which prevents the development of accessory pathway in Epstein's because the uh, tricuspid valve is pulled apically, there is deficiency of that fibrous ring and you can have multiple accessory pathways, as many as 8 different accessory pathways. Again, pre-excitation is part and parcel of AF. You can have AVRTs, they are right-sided AVRTs. Remember, it's a problem the tricuspid valve or type B accessory pathways. Please read about the arrhythmias in Epstein's. They've gone into great detail. We have taught since the patient has a risk of AF, this patient has an accessory pathway, can go in for a pre-excited AF, can go in for 1 is to 1 conduction, so this is in VF. One of the mechanisms of sudden cardiac death is patient going in for a pre-excited AF. They have a hugely directed atria, patient can go in for AF. Since there is an accessory pathway, you can go in for a pre-excited AF, 1 is to 1 conduction, VF and death of the patient. False about leadless pacemaker in comparison with conventional pacemaker, it is definitely smaller there is definitely a lower risk of infection and can be done when upper limb access is not available. It has a comparable 
battery life to conventional pacemaker. That's the correct answer. So remember, it is smaller. It has a lower risk of infection and can be done when upper limb access is not available. It has a comparable life, not a longer life. So what is this leadless pacemaker? You see, this is a normal pacemaker. It has a pulse generator. It has a lead. So how do you place the pulse generator? You make an incision here. You create a pocket. So when you end, you place the pulse generator inside that pocket. So you have complications related to the pocket. So you can have pocket hematoma. You can have pocket infection. You can have the pulse generator eroding and coming outside. How do you place the lead? You have to puncture the subclave in vein. So when you puncture the subclave in vein, you can cause an arterial puncture. You can cause a pneumothorax, hemothorax, hemoneumothorax. Again, this lead can go in for perforation. So you have pulse generator related complications. So you have lead related complications and you have a puncture related complications. All of this can be avoided if you use a leadless pacemaker. You see this here, there is no pulse generator, so no PG related complications. There is no lead, so no lead related complications. You are not introducing it through a subclavian route, you are introducing it through the femoral route. There is no risk of pneumothorax or hemothorax. So there is no PG, there is no lead, there is no subclavian puncture. So you can see here, can be done when upper limb axis is not available. This is a true statement. It is done to the femoral root. So the battery life is comparable. Which is the most, which is the most common organism causing early prosthetic valve endocarditis? This is Staph aureus. Again, nothing to discuss. We have already discussed this. This is my slide. So you can see prosthetic valve infective endocarditis. Less than two months. It is called as early prosthetic valve infective endocarditis. Your most common cause is Staph aureus. So less than two months, your most common is early PVE, your most common cause is staph. Late, two to 12 months, your most common cause is cons followed by staph. And more than 12 months, it mimics a community acquired infective endocarditis, where your common cause is strep viridans. So two, less than two months, it's staph. Two to 12 months, it is cons. And after 12 months, it mimics a community acquired infective endocarditis, where your commonest organ is strep viridans. So I made a statement. All infective endocarditis is caused by staph aureus except late prosthetic valve infective endocarditis and community acquired infective endocarditis. This is a statement I made. All IE is caused by staph aureus except late PVE and community acquired infective endocarditis. So staph aureus, if you don't know the cause, it is the commonest cause of IE, it's the commonest cause of acute infective endocarditis, commonest cause of healthcare associated infective endocarditis, commonest cause of IE in drug abusers, Commonest cause of early PEV, commonest cause of infection of CIED, which is, which is uh, uh, commonest cause of stentocarditis. If your blood culture shows staph, do an echo throughout infective endocarditis. That's why I said all infective endocarditis is caused by staph aureus except late prosthetic valve infective endocarditis and community acquired infective endocarditis. Please look at the lectures. So, two more questions on infective endocarditis. Patient at age 3 has a repaired VSD and RBOT conduit, no residual shunt. So again, this must be some sort of top physiology, which is fully corrected. So fully corrected top physiology. Age 6, he requires a dental procedure, which is true about profile axis. This is cyanotic congenital heart disease, fully corrected. You require profile access only for the first 6 months. Cyanotic heart disease, congenital heart disease, fully corrected. Profile access only for the first 6 months. We will discuss this along with the next question. Patient with a bioprosthetic valve one year ago is planned for tooth extraction bar root canal treatment. True about infective endocarditis profile axis. It is true you have to give it because it's a bioprosthetic valve. This is a false statement. It is also needed due to a dental procedure. I don't know what option D is. Must be A plus C. So because it's a bioprosthetic valve, he needs IE profile axis. Because he's undergoing tooth extraction, he again needs IE profile axis. Option D must be a combination of uh, A and C. I'm not very sure about that. We'll anyway discuss the indications of IE profile axis. So whom do we give profile axis? Previously, we used to give profile axis left and right, MR, A or T or whatever. But now the guidelines have changed. We only give it for highest risk patients undergoing the highest risk procedures. Both should be there. Both highest risk patients as well as highest risk procedures. So who are the highest risk patients? Previous infective endocarditis, number one. Number two. Prosthetic cardiac valve or prosthetic material used to repair a cardiac valve. This is what our question is. Prosthetic cardiac valve can be a mechanical processes, can be a bioprocesses, TAVI valve, homograft, whatever. So prosthetic cardiac valve or material used to repair a cardiac valve like an anloplasty ring or a mitraclet. 
post transplant cardiac valvulopathy uncorrected cyanotic heart disease lifelong whether it's a palliative shunt or a palliative conduit does not matter for example glen is a palliative shunt okay or a palliative conduit this requires lifelong prophylaxis fully corrected congenital heart disease for the first six months partially corrected congenital heart disease with residual defects at the site or adjacent to site of processes again lifelong suppose you have a vsd this does not require infective endocarditis prophylaxis it's not a cyanotic heart disease suppose you have a vsd and you have closed it with a device this requires ie prophylaxis for six months suppose you have a vsd you have closed it with a device but there is a residual shunt this residual shunt impairs endothelialization so you have to give it lifelong this is your example so vsd no need for profile access if you have put in a device and the device is has no residual shunt six months if you have put in a device there is still a residual shunt that residual shunt impairs endothelialization now you have to give it lifelong the highest risk procedures are basically dental procedures manipulation of gingival tissue periapical teeth perforation of oral mucosa you can have a look in the videos Again, these are the procedures not required. Gento inventory, GI procedures, bronchoscopy, again not required. Suppose you are taking a biopsy, you are, in, you are damaging the mucous membrane, now you have to give profile access. Again, all of this has been explained, so I am not going into details. So, bioprosthetic valve definitely requires IE profile access. Please remember that. So, right sided aortic arch is associated with, again, we have discussed right sided aortic arch in detail. This is the Pattinson series. Okay, the commonest cause of right side aortic arch is truncus arteriosus, 30 to 50 percent, followed by TOF 25 percent, followed by TG and VSD. In TOF also you have a gradation. There is 13 percent to 34 uh, percent chance of right aortic arch in TOF. So the more severe the RVOT obstruction, the more likely the patient is to have a right side aortic arch. So if you have pulmonary atresia in TOF. The most severe form of RVOT obstruction, your chance of having a right aortic arch is 34%. If you have mild PS, your chance of having a right aortic arch is 13%. Overall, your average is 25%. But remember this, the more severe the RVOT obstruction, the more likely you are to have a right aortic arch. So pulmonary atresia is your most severe form of RVOT obstruction. It is 34%. Mild PS is your least severe. It's 13%. Overall, your average is 25%. So again, the answer is VST with pulmonary attrition. So the, I, I, the fourth option was not truncus arteriosus. If it's truncus arteriosus, then obviously that's the answer. So 60 year old hypertensive female with hypothyroidism on thyroxine, TFT is normal, bilateral OA, plan for knee replacement, sent for cardiology evaluation, what would be a test to be done? Again, this is a pretty logical question. If you send this question, a patient to me, I will do an ECG, echo, and I will give a fitness, but unfortunately, the options are given in front of you. Is this a high risk patient? No, it's an intermediate risk patient. So, straight away, both of this is out. This is an intermediate risk patient. She just has hypertension. She's planned for an intermediate risk procedure like knee replacement, and uh, he has hypothyroidism. So, again, will you do a TMT for this patient? Remember, bilateral OA knee, plan for knee replacement. You cannot do a TMT. So, the only remaining option is option A. So, again, you can rule it out. So anyway, TMT is not possible for a patient with bilateral OANE plan for knee replacement and it's an intermediate risk procedure. Using that, the answer is option A. Left popliteal plus common femoral vein DVT with a segmental pulmonary embolism. So the patient has extensive DVT and has a segmental small pulmonary embolism. BP normal, pulse normal, SpO2 normal, creatine clearance reasonably okay, drop negative, BNP negative. So how do you manage this? No thrombolysis. Thrombolysis is done for massive pulmonary embolism. Selected cases of submassive pulmonary embolism. This is again a segmental PT. Okay, it's not a, you know, it doesn't come under the criteria. So lower risk, one dose heparin followed by warfarin. Obviously a wrong statement. Okay, if you give heparin, you have to bridge it. Okay, because this is a pulmonary embolism, you have to bridge it. Okay, is this patient high risk? Obviously not. This is a low risk patient. So again, this is the answer. Low risk, apixaban 10 BD followed, followed by 5 mg OD, standard dose. So again, this is a, remember this is a low risk patient. So obviously option D is out, option A is out. And you don't give one dose of enoxaparin, you have to give enoxaparin, bridge it with warfarin. 
Answer is option C. Patient present with hef, uh, hefpef, diabetic 9.8, which drug has mortality benefit? Very clear. There is only one drug having a mortality benefit. It is SGLT2 inhibitor and the drug is empagliflozin as per the Emperor Preserve trial. Again, the same question was asked in the INISS. Please look at that video. So again, the M Emperor Preserve trial came out in October 14, 2021. It showed, it showed a uh, benefit with respect to combined outcome of uh, hospitalization and mortality. Remember, it is a composite outcome, a combined outcome of mortality plus hospitalization, primarily driven by hospitalizations. So the only drug which is beneficial as of right now is an SGLT2 inhibitor. The only drug that studied so far is a SG is a empagliflozin. So elderly female hypertensive obstructive sleep apnea concentric hypertrophy on the echo. True statement except again we were not able to recall option C and D. So it's very difficult for me to comment. Restrictive pattern is grade three and grade four diastolic dysfunction. You obviously have an increased LAP. Restrictive pattern and pseudo normalization denotes diastolic dysfunction has an increased LAP. This is true. Again, I cannot comment on this because I don't know option C and D. So, uh, so the, we'll go for the next question. Patient with calcific severe calcific AS underwent TAVR, developed paravalvular leak. True statement except. More common in SAVR than TAVR. Straight away, this is a false statement. More common in a calcified valve. This is true. Can be reduced by balloon plasty. This is something I have not been able to find out. Multiple paravalvular leaks can be present in TAVR. This is true. So again, this is a state. This is directly taken from my uh, pres presentation. More common in TAVR is the risk of paravalvular leak. So you have discussed comparison of the complications between TAVR and SAVR. More common in TAVR is paravalvular leak. So why does paravalvular leak occur? So suppose this is the aorta. This is the aorta. When you put in a prosthetic valve, you want the prosthetic valve to sit perfectly. You want the prosthetic valve to sit perfectly in the aortic annulus. Now suppose you have multiple foci of calcium. Remember these are elderly patients. Suppose you have multiple calcium spurs here. If you place a valve, this valve cannot sit properly. The calcium spur is going to prevent the valve from sitting properly. Okay, and it is through these gaps that a paravalvular leak will develop. So you can have a paravalvular leak here, here. So why does a mostly why does a paravalvular leak develop? It is because you have calcium spurs. Okay, the spur creates an uneven surface. And the valve cannot sit properly over this uneven surface and through these gaps you can develop a leak. So the calcium spur prevents the uh, valve from sitting properly because it creates an uneven surface. Through this uh, through these gaps you can develop a paravalvular leak so you can have multiple leaks. It is seen more in a calcified valve. Now what does the surgeon do? The surgeon can scrape away all this calcium. So the surgeon will scrape away all this calcium and then he will put in the valve. That is why SAVR has lesser chance of paravalvular leak. TAVR you don't have that option. So it is less common in SAVR when compared to TAVR. So this is the answer. So it is more seen in a calcified valve. You can have multiple paravalvular leaks. Dysplastic pulmonary valve feature is postenotic dilation, commissural fusion of three leaflets, absent P2, phasic ejection click. The answer is absent P2. So again, See, dysplastic, see, how is a normal pulmonary valve look? So, this is how a normal pulmonary valve looks. I want you to look, look here. One, it is tri-leaflet. Look at the cusps here. There is no commissural fusion. There is no commissural fusion. There is no commissural fusion and the valve is thin. So, you can see thin supple valve leaflets with no commissural fusion. This is how routine pulmonary stenosis looks. The commissures are fused. You can see the commissures here. They are fused. There is commissural fusion. Okay. This is dysplastic pulmonary valve. Okay. Again, no commissural fusion. The commissures are free, but the valve is thick and immobile. So, markedly thick and immobile cusps due to disorganized myxomatous tissue. So, when you have a normal pulmonary stenosis, there is commissural fusion. Okay, when you have a dysplastic pulmonary valve, there is no commissural fusion, but the valve is thickened and immobile. Which patient is going to respond better to a balloon, balloon valvotomy? This patient, because you can now split the commissures. So, your routine 
pulmonary stenosis responds well towards balloon valvotomy because there is commissural fusion you can split the commissures there is nothing to split here so there is poor response to balloon valvotomy so again you can see the dysplastic this is normal pulmonary stenosis you can see this doming here the valve domes so the valve is doming like this you can see the valve doming here so why it is because of the increased pressure in the rv the increased pressure in the rv causes the valve to dome like this and then it opens with a click so the increased pressure is causing the valve to dome and finally it opens with a click so you have doming as well as ejection click occurring so doming and ejection click occurs in normal pulmonary stenosis okay so normal pulmonary stenosis uh, so dysplastic ps has nuance or a family history you have abnormal facies so you have doming of the valve in systole why because of commissural fusion you have the ejection click when the valve suddenly opens there is no doming there is no ejection click there is postenotic dilation in normal pulmonary stenosis there is no postenotic dilation in dysplastic ps again i said balloon tricuspid valve a good response poor response so remember this all of this uh, we have this we have i'm discussing right now because again dysplastic ps is a bit of a higher level topic expecting an md pg to know it is probably a bit over zealous but anyway we'll discuss this so again postenotic dilation it is seen in routine periphery routine normal ps commissural fusion seen in regular ps ejection click seen in regular ps absent p2 is seen in severe ps whether it is dysplastic or non dysplastic pulmonary valve it does not matter it is seen in both so postenotic dilation commissural fusion ejection click all are seen in normal severe ps absent p2 is seen both in routine ps as well as in dysplastic ps okay young female cardio presents to cardiology op with brother history of palpitations presents on examination she has asd with thumb deformities brother evaluated for a familial syndrome found to have vsd tvx 5g in s positive they are clearly dealing with the holtorum syndrome again we have discussed everything on holtorum syndrome holtorum syndrome is called heart and hand syndrome tvx 5g 100% upper limb abnormalities usually as a triphalangeal or absent thumb again anything from here to here abnormalities have all been described cardiac your most common is osasd for a muscular vsd av blocks and af remember osasd is your most common in all have been described this is a case of holtorum you can see triphalangeal thumb one phalanx here one phalanx here one phalanx here so triphalangeal thumb your normal thumb has two phalanx this is called as fingerization of thumb you don't know which is the thumb here so fingerization of thumb so again fingerization of thumb again all sorts of upper limb abnormalities have been described we go to the next question just stage 1 valsalva in valsalva is a topic which i intended to teach you and somewhere along the way it got lost this is again very important topic we'll deal with that in, we'll discuss that in great detail in a, another session so what happens in stage 1 valsalva so this is your valsalva curve remember blood pressure and heart rate go in opposite directions so bp increases heart rate decreases and vice versa so when you in stage 1 you close your mouth you close your nostrils and then you inhale this increases intrathoracic as well as intra abdominal pressure the increase intra thoracic pressure is going to compress your aorta it is going to compress your vena cava so when you compress your vena cava your venous return is going to decrease when you compress your uh, aorta your aortic pressure is going to increase and this aortic since your aortic pressure is increases increases your bp is going to increase when your bp increases your baroreceptors are stimulated this causes increase in vagal tone and this causes bradycardia so again so when you have when you uh, close your mouth and close your nose you perform valsalva you have an increased intra thoracic and intra abdominal pressure your vena cava is uh, compressed so this causes a decreased venous return your aorta is compressed it causes increase in blood pressure this increase in blood pressure is going to cause baroreceptor stimulation this causes uh, increase in vagal tone this causes bradycardia and again this is corrected later in stage 2 answers increased intra thoracic pressure increased pp decreased sympathetic tone there is increased parasympathetic tone again we'll have a detailed discussion on this later ischemic cardiomyopathy with moderate mr cause of mr again a bit of a high level question the answer is tethering of valve so we'll explain this this is a normal uh, lv with a normal mitral valve so this is the basolateral segment of the lv 
So this is where this is the posteromedial papillary muscle. So you can see there's caudate tendinous attached to the posteromedial papillary muscle. This attached to the mitral leaflets. So you have normal coaptation. You have a tent being generated here. Okay. So you have the the posteromedial the basolateral segment is your most important segment. Again, this is circumflex territory. Okay. So your basolateral segment is your most important segment for this ischemic MR. So again, this is your posteromedial papillary muscle. You have the caudate tendine and you have the valve. So the valve has a tent which has a coaptation zone. So the valve coaps like this. This is the coaptation zone. When you have an inferior wall MI, let's say a circumflex lesion, this part is going to bulge out. Okay. The papillary muscle is going to be displaced. So your papillary muscle is displaced outward. It pulls the caudate tendine and pulls apart the valve. Your valve is going to open. Now we develop an MR. Okay. So what happens when you have a circumflex infarct? So your basolateral segment is going to be infarcted. So you, this goes in for an aneurysmal dial aneurysm. So there's some degree of dyskinesia. here. It becomes it comes outwards. So your postro postromedial papillary muscle is displaced. This papillary muscle is displaced laterally, pulls the caudate tendine, and the caudate tendine is pulled, and the valve opens, causing an MR. That is why circumflex lesions are notorious for an MR. So if you have to develop ischemic MR. You need to have the basolateral segment, this segment to be involved. Now, this can be as part of an inferior wall MI where the circumflex is involved, or as part of a DCM where you have global hypokinesia. In DCM, everything is involved, including the basolateral segment. So, if you want to have ischemic MR, the basolateral segment has to be involved, either alone or as part of a global hypokinesia. So, again, this is what I explained here. So, again, Remember basolateral segment displaced outward, posteromedial displacement occurs, it pulls the caudate tendine, opens up the mitral valve, this is called as leaflet tethering. Okay, again bit of a higher level, okay, it's practically a DM level question, but again they have asked you, that I, that's why I told you there are around four, five, there are around six to eight questions which are at a much higher level. Okay, so tethering of the valve is the answer. Does it resolve completely with revascularization? No. If you do a CABG, 50% will resolve, 50% will be left behind. Okay. Beta blocker resolves it. This is a false statement. A centimeters decrease it, but even then they don't resolve it. Less common with basolateral, false. If you have to have ischemic MR, your basolateral segment has to be involved. Basic mechanism is augmented deflet tethering due to outward displacement of papillary muscles by LV remodeling or dilation, what I just explained. Which complication will you expect in a boy with congenitally corrected TGA? The answer is heart block. We have already stressed this a lot during our discussions. This is our discussion. You can see a marked here, highlighted, starred AV block. So AV block is part and parcel of congenitally corrected transposition of great vessels. It can occur at any time from birth to middle age. A lot of conduction abnormalities I have described. So duplication of the SA nodes and AV nodes have inversion of bundles. A lot of conduction abnormalities have been described. Remember, AV block is part and parcel. It can occur at any time from birth all the way to middle age. Patient treated for DTGA by arterial switch. What is the long-term complication? It is neoaortic regurgitation. Again, we have discussed this. So what happens when you do an arterial switch? You cut the aorta, cut the pulmonary artery, switch them apart. Okay. So cut the aorta here, cut the pulmonary artery here, exchange them. Then you place the coronary arteries into the neo aorta. Okay. So cut the pulmonary artery, cut the aorta, exchange them and place the coronary arteries into the neo aorta. Okay. The most common complication and the most problematic complication is coronary obstruction or stenosis. Why does this happen? Look how small the heart is. It's barely fits in barely at one by third of an adult palm. Even the instruments are bigger than the heart. Now you have to take this tiny coronary artery and stitch it to the neo aorta. And this often goes in for coronary stenosis, coronary obstruction. This is your most dreaded complication. You can also have supravalvular PS or neo aortic AS. And the answer to this question, neo aortic regurgitation. So remember, neo aortic regurgitation is your answer to this question. Although the most dreaded complication is coronary obstruction or stenosis. We go to the next question. A 20 year old patient with SPO2 of 84% who is now asymptomatic has a history of previous neonatal cyanosis. He is clubbed. 
he has thickening of upper limb and lower limb digits. What is the most probable diagnosis? Diagnosis: PDA, TGA VSDPS, Epstein's, tricuspid atresia VSDPS. Now here's the important thing: this patient has history of neonatal cyanosis, followed by the patient becoming acyanotic. followed by reappearance of cyanosis, probably somewhere in his late teens. So neonatal cyanosis, transient neonatal cyanosis, the patient becoming acyanotic, followed by reappearance of cyanosis. Now this is a very characteristic disease progression and it is seen in Epstein's anomaly. Now this is something which I have already discussed in our videos. So please have a look at the presentation of Epstein's. The timestamp is given, it's around 34 minutes, 37 seconds. Where we have discussed transient neonatal cyanosis as a presentation of Epstein's anomaly. So we have also discussed the mechanism. So cyanosis in Epstein's depends on the ASD. So whenever you have a high RA pressure, you're going to have a right to left shunt from the ASD and now you will have cyanosis. So when you're born, which is the dominant chamber, your RARV is your dominant chamber. Your RA pressure is going to be high. You will have the development of a right to left shunt and the patient is cyanotic. So when you are born or in your neonatal period, your RARV is your dominant chamber, your RA pressure is going to be high, there is going to be a right to left shunt and you have cyanosis. Now quickly, let's say around 4 weeks, your left heart starts becoming the dominant chamber, your LA pressure starts to rise and now you have the development of a left to right shunt and your cyanosis disappears. So when you are born, your right heart is the dominant chamber. There is going to be right to left shunting of blood from the ASD and you have cyanosis. So quickly your left heart takes over, it becomes the dominant chamber. Now you have a left to right shunting taking place and your cyanosis disappears. So we have already established transient neonatal cyanosis, how the child becomes acyanotic when the left heart takes over. Now why does the cyanosis reappear? It reappears because the RV fails. So sometime in your adult life, your RV is now going to fail. So when your RV fails, your RV pressure once again rises, your RA pressure again rises, you have the re-establishment of a right to left shunt. So very important. So why does neonatal cyanosis occurs? It occurs because when you are born, your RARV is your dominant chamber, you have a right to left shunt. Why does the child become asymptomatic? Because now your left heart takes over, you have a left to right shunt. Why does cyanosis reappear when the RV fails? Your RV is already small in Epstein's. When your RV fails, your RV pressure increases, your RA pressure increases. You have the re-establishment of a right to left shunt and you have the reappearance of cyanosis. A very characteristic presentation of Epstein's. This is something we have already dealt with. So even if you don't know, don't know this, you can still answer this question. Remember, this patient is asymptomatic. So when does a PDA go for cyanosis? When he develops Eisenmenger. A PDA Eisenmenger is almost always symptomatic. He will have at least dyspnea, he will have fatigue, he will have all those sort of Eisenmenger symptoms. So PDA is out. So again, there is no re-establishment of cyanosis in a PDA. So what about TGA, VSDPS and tricuspetricia VSDPS? Remember, you, they are usually cyanotic unless because already the pulmonary blood flow is now decreased. So in a cyanotic heart disease, the degree of cyanosis is dependent upon your pulmonary blood flow. So when you have PS, your pulmonary blood flow is automatically decreased. So by exclusion also, the answer becomes Epstein's. And remember, TGA VSD PS, Trichospetricia VSD PS, your survival is also pretty dismal. So again, survival is a big question mark in these conditions. So even with that, you can straight away diagnose Epstein's. So remember the other ways, PDA, which when it goes in for Eisenmenger is symptomatic, TGA VSDPS, Trichospetricia VSDPS, surviving up to age 20 with the patient become, with the patient being asymptomatic is a big question mark. So you're automatically left with Epstein's anomaly. We go to the next question. Child bought with cyanotic spells, mother tells history of cyanosis on examination sawing wood murmur. When you hear the term sawing wood murmur, your diagnosis is tough with absent pulmonary valve. You need to look at other, other clinical history. This is our TOF with absent pulmonary valve is. So you can see it's, it's a very rare form of TOF, 2 to 6 percent. 
what happens here is you have pulmonary annular stenosis. So there is a stenotic component which is pulmonary annular stenosis. Remember there is no valve. The annulus is stenosed. So this is the stenosed annulus. Remember there is no valve. This causes an ejection systolic murmur as blood flows across it. This causes an ESM. There is no pulmonary valve. So there is free PR. Okay, there is free PR and this causes an EDM. So what is the obstructive component? It is pulmonary and stenosis. This causes an ejection systolic murmur. There is no pulmonary valve. So there is free pulmonary regurgitation. This causes an EDM. So you have an ESM, you have an EDM. This is called the sawing wood murmur. Very characteristic of top with absent pulmonary valve. Since there is such a huge amount of PR, you have aneurysmal related PA and main, main, main pulmonary artery, left and right pulmonary arteries, the RV is huge. So you have RV failure because of the very large R, RV volume overload. The aneurysmal related pulmonary artery will cause tracheobronchial compression and these are your two causes of death. So remember pulmonary artery stenosis causes ESM, free PR causes the EDM, sawing wood murmur, Cause of death are RV failure and tracheobronchial compression. So all of this have been discussed. You can see pulmonary annular stenosis, sawing wood murmur, pulmonary artery aneurysmal dilation. All of this have been discussed. So case scenario suggestive of aortic stenosis. So some case scenario is given suggestive of aortic stenosis. Pmax of 5.1, gradient of 64, valve surface area of 0.92, calcific deposits in aortic valve. So they asked you what was the diagnosis. It is very severe AS. Yes. Again. The term very severe AS is seldom used. Okay, then it's not given in Braunwald also, but anyway, it's seldom used. But the answer is very severe AS. So if you look, if you search on the internet for very severe AS, you get varying definitions based on the valve surface area. I'll take the most common, most reputed one. This is from the ESC 2021 valve guidelines. Very severe AS, mean gradient of more than 60 or Vmax of more than 5. It does not mention valve area. Please remember this. The ESC 2021 guidelines does not mention the valve area. So very severe AS is a mean gradient of more than 60 or a Vmax of more than 5. Let's look at the 2014 ACC guidelines. Very severe AS, aortic valve velocity of more than 5. This also does not mention valve area. Then you have a textbook of echocardiography by Otto. When you become DM student, you will study this. It is mentions a particular point that if your Vmax is more than 5, you need not even look at your valve area. It is straight away very severe AS. That's why I said very severe AS, you need not even look at the valve area. If your Vmax is more than 5, if your gradient is more than 60, it automatically suggests a very severe AS. And you have to replace that valve. Okay. So identify the wrong statement. They gave you an image somewhere similar to this. It's basically MS, mitral stenosis. Intensity of murmur directly proportional to severity. Again, the again it's a wrong statement. Okay, in MS, it's the length of murmur that is proportional to severity. Okay, so I made an exception here. If you look at my videos, the intensity of murmur has no relation to severity in MS. But if you have a diastolic thrill. It indicates severe MS. This is an observation which I made in the lectures. It's a the intensity of murmur has no relationship to the severity. That is a well-known statement. However, if you have a diastolic thrill, which indicates a grade 4 murmur, it indicates a severe MS. This is a discordance. Again, I told, told this in the videos. A2OS uh, interval increases with increasing severity. Again, this is a false statement. Okay. Short A2OS interval, severe MS. Long A2OS interval, mild MS. Again, calcified mitral valve, hockey stick, this is probably in the echo images. So I would write it as A2OS interval uh, increases with increasing in severity. Increases with A2OS in interval increases with increase in severity as the false statement. A2OS interval is inversely proportional to the severity of MS. Short A2OS, severe MS. Long A2OS, mild MS. So 60 year old female status post MVR now presents in cardiac failure. She has atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular rate. Echo shows normally functioning mitral prosthesis with moderate AR. What is the treatment of choice? So remember status M post MVR normally functioning prosthesis AF with a fast rate and uh, she has moderate MR. What is the treatment of choice? 
What would be the treatment of choice? Remember, she is in CCF. What is the cause of CCF? It is atrial fibrillation with RVR. Remember, the prosthesis is functioning normally. Moderate AR that cannot cause cardiac failure. So please remember that. The mitral valve prosthesis is functioning normally. So it cannot cause cardiac failure. Your moderate AR cannot cause cardiac failure. Only severe AR can cause cardiac failure. So what is causing cardiac failure is AF. And what will be the treatment of choice? It is, you have to revert this AF. Either DC or drug induced. You can give a pharmacological cardioversion or a DC cardioversion. Rhythm control strategy is your treatment of choice. I would prefer a DC cardioversion, but some people can also give amedron. That is their choice. Okay, so the ideal treatment would be for a rhythm control strategy. Unfortunately, the options do not have a rhythm control strategy. So the alternative is you give a beta blocker. So if the rhythm control is not uh, possible, then you go for a rate control strategy. And what is the best agent to control AF rate? It is a beta blocker. Please remember that. So what is the ideal strategy? It is a rhythm control either DC or pharmacological. Since there is no rhythm control, you can go in for a rate control strategy and the best drug to control rate is a beta blocker. Okay, there's no question, there's no question of an IIT valve replacement for a moderate AR. Digoxin is a drug seldom given in cardiology. Remember, digoxin should only, it's never, it's almost very seldom or very sparingly given in cardiology. Okay, the drug, the best drug to control AF rate is a beta blocker if the patient can tolerate it. 18 year old asymptomatic male continuous murmur on auscultation peaking around S2 left second intercostal space close to the sternum. So basically it's a murmur of a PDA. No doubt about it. Typical exam case. You hear a continuous murmur here. It's a PDA. Absolutely no question. Peaking around S2. Again PDA. So again continuous machinery murmur of Gibson. This is the PDA murmur. You can see where is the murmur peaking. It is peaking around S2. We have already discussed this. Murmur peaks around S2. Okay. Where is it hurt? It is hurt in the second left intercostal space. This is your typical site for PDA. This is your typical site for PDA. Second left intercostal space. Where does it peak? Around S2. Okay. Where does the coronary AV fistula murmur peak? It peaks in diastole. Remember, coronary AV fistula can also cause continuous murmur, but the continuous murmur peaks in diastole. Why? Coronary blood flow is maximum in diastole. So anyway, peaking around S2, the site, it's all typical of a PDA murmur or a Gibson's murmur. Cause of organic continuous murmur, again, the answer is Alkapa. We have dealt extensively with continuous murmur. Hyperplastic left heart, MS plus MR, AS plus AR, they don't cause continuous murmurs. So again, we have dealt with Myers classification. Please have a look in the PDA module. So venous hum and mammary souffle are normal physiological continuous murmurs. Again, you can see Alkapa here. We have dealt all with all of this. Please have a look at the PDA module. We have, we have dealt with each of this. We have explained why these cause continuous murmurs. So again, it can be due to localized arterial obstructions. 30 year old patient who is asymptomatic has a crescendo decrescendo murmur heard in the left third intercostal space near sternal border with normal S1, normal A2 and P2. What is your diagnosis? So patient is asymptomatic has a crescendo decrescendo murmur where left third intercostal space s1 normal a2 p2 normal what would be the answer the answer is pulmonary stenosis okay i'll explain to you why you what is a crescendo decrescendo murmur also called as so this is s1 this is s2 this is s1 this is how a crescendo decrescendo murmur looks so what is a crescendo decrescendo murmur also called as it is called an ejection systolic murmur a crescendo decrescendo murmur is also called an ejection systolic murmur. So you have an ejection and then followed by decreased flow. So ejection of blood and then decreased flow of blood. A crescendo decrescendo murmur is also called an ejection systolic murmur. And where does ejection occur? It occurs in the pulmonary artery or aorta. Nowhere else can you have ejection. So if you have an ejection systolic murmur, it can only occur at sites where ejection occurs, which is the pulmonary artery or aorta. So it can be a supravalvular uh, PS, it can be a valvular PS, can be a subvalvular PS, it can be a supravalvular AS a su or, IOT or AS or a subvalvular AS, somewhere in the aorta or pulmonary artery. So remember, so you, the only possibility in this case for injection systolic murmur or a crescendo decrescendo murmur is a PS. 
Now, why is there a normal S1, normal A2, P2? Mild PS or moderate PS, you can have normal P2, especially mild PS. It's only when the PS is severe that P2 is absent. Please remember that. So, mild PS can have a normal P2. And remember, mild PS can remain mild PS for long periods of time. Mild AS will progress to moderate AS, will progress to severe AS if the patient lives long enough. Mild PS can remain mild PS for years together. Moderate PS can remain moderate PS for years together. So the patient is asymptomatic, has, norm, has a murmur here in the left side and third intercostal space. Everything is normal. This is probably a mild PS. PAH is going to be symptomatic. Double outer right ventricle is cyanotic. Muscular VSD again, it's a pan systolic murmur or an early systolic murmur. So, again, remember, ejection systolic murmur occurs at sites of ejection, pulmonary artery and aorta. So, again, we all know who this guy is. This is the pulmonary, uh, this is the second left intercostal space. The pulmonary valve is situated somewhere here. You have the pulmonary arteries like this. So, supravalvular PS is best heard where? In the infraclavicular area. So, supravalvular PS or peripheral PS in the infraclavicular area. Murmur of ESM is best heard in the infraclavicular area. Valvular PS is best heard in the pulmonary area. Subvalvular PS is best heard in the one space below, in the left third intercostal space. Please remember that. So, yeah, that's why. This is probably an infundibular PS. Okay. So, Valvular PS best heard in the second left intercostal space. Supravalvular PS best heard in the uh, infraclavicular areas. Subvalvular PS one space below the left third intercostal space. So this is probably some sort of a subvalvular PS. We will come to the next question. In case of cardiac remodeling, what are the changes that occur? Increase tropomyosin, increase sodium calcium exchanger, decrease beta 2 adrenergic receptors, increase cal sequestrin. Again, this is the table from Braunwald. I don't know how you are expected to remember this table. If they ask you a direct repeat next year, please use this to answer this. So, sodium calcium exchanger has increased. Beta 1 receptors are decreased. Beta 2 is increased. Tropomyosin is normal. Cal sequestrin is normal. The answer is increase in sodium calcium exchanger. Again, very difficult to expect uh, somebody to learn this table. But however, if they ask a straight repeat next year, please do answer this. One important thing I would like to say is beta 1 is to beta 2 receptor ratio in the heart is 80 is to 20. So beta 1 is to beta 2 receptor in the heart is 80 is to 20. When you have heart failure, beta 1 is going to decrease, beta 2 is going to increase. This is something I want you to know. But the others, it's practically humanly not possible to ask you to remember it. So if you get a straight repeat, please do answer it. Drug use in the treatment of long QT syndrome. Again, straight. It's a very simple question. The answer is beta blockers. Okay. Let me ask you a question. Beta blockers, let's say this. Bradycardia prolongs QT interval. That's a very famous statement. Bradycardia is prolongs QT interval. Beta blockers cause bradycardia. Then how is it used in the treatment of long QT? So, bradycardia causes a prolonged QT. Beta blockers cause bradycardia. Then how is beta blocker? Used in the treatment of long QT. The answer is this. Please look at the calcium uh, cardiac channel of this module. For tossard to occur, you need a substrate, a long QT and a long, a long short sequence. Trigger of an early after depolarization and a dispersion of refractiveness. Again, these terms look complex to you, but please look at the cardiac channel of this one. We have gone in for detail in for a detailed explanation. So, what is this dispersion of uh, repolarization? The epicardium, mid-myocardium and endocardium, all these three have different duration of action potential. You can see here, the action potential is of different duration. One is longer than the other. So, let's see here. Normally, it is 230 milliseconds in the epicardium, 289 milliseconds in the myocardium. The dispersion is 59 milliseconds. When there is long QT, it is whatever cause, hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, drugs, you can see there is different dispersions. The epicardium, it becomes 261. The myocardium, it becomes 359. Your dispersion of refractiveness is going to increase, 98. So, your mid-myocardium is going to, action potential is going to elongate even further.
So what was 59 now becomes 98. So there is dispersion of repolarization. This can set in a re-entry circuit. Then we have explained all of this. What a beta blocker does is it causes homogeneity of repolarization. So epicardium is going to increase, myocardium is going to increase, endocardium is going to increase. All of this is going to increase uniformly. So there's going to be less dispersion. So instead of myocardium becoming prolonged out of proportion, beta blocker is going to cause homogeneity of dispersion. So epicardium, myocardium, endocardium, all of the action potential will elongate, see elongate in the same way. There is less dispersion of repolarization, less chance of re-entry. That is why beta blockers, despite causing bradycardia, can be used in long QT because it prevents dispersion of refractiveness. Again, with this, we come to the end of the discussion. Again, it was a very long paper. People who wrote the exam paper also said the question stems were very long. They found, they found time management to be difficult. Again, it, it is a difficult paper. As I said, around six to eight questions were of a far higher standard. Some, some were even poor, even DM final year standards. Again, be happy if you have studied because you want a tough question paper. Okay, You don't want a very simple paper so that everyone answers and even if you score something like 95%, you will still have a doubt whether you'll get a seat. Okay. You want a tough paper. You want your first plan to be around 66%. Then only it will be helpful for people who have studied. So with this, I wish you all of uh, the luck and I hope you get your dream seat. Thank you.